Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Well, that's, yeah, let's hear a little call and response. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. All right, fantastic. Welcome to our Ask With Forum for this evening with Chancellor Kaya Henderson and Josephine Robinson. So the first thing I want to do is just to remind you that our Ask With Forums are a series of public lectures that bring leaders in the field to share their knowledge with us, to generate spirited conversation, and to offer insight into the highest priority challenges facing education. So the forums are a prominent part of our school's outreach efforts, and we encourage you to join us in many of the forums that we're going to have uh, in the upcoming year. So I just want to tell you a little bit about the format for this evening. This is going to be a moderated discussion. And so uh, Chancellor Henderson and Josephine and I will be sitting here, and we're going to actually have a really wonderful sort of open conversation about uh, the topic of the evening, which is partnerships with families and communities. And we are going to circulate cards to you for questions. And I'll give you a point uh, in the evening where I'll ask you to start thinking about your questions. And what's going to happen is they'll be collected. You'll, uh, I think, sort of pass them to the ends of your rows. And then I will select some questions uh, for us to ask. That way, I think we can get more questions in that way. And so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to read the introductions of our fabulous guests. And then we're also going to show you a short video about celebrating the fifth year anniversary of uh, Chancellor Henderson's tenure in DC public schools. So first, let me read their bios. So Kaya Henderson, Kaya Henderson has served as chancellor of the DC public schools since November 2010. Under her leadership, DCPS has become the fastest improving urban school district in the country. Henderson joined DC. Yes, let's that gets a round of applause. Yes, it does. Uh, chancellor Henderson joined DCPS in 2007 as the deputy chancellor responsible for overseeing the Office of Human Capital. Prior to joining DCPS, Henderson was a partner at the New Teacher Project and executive director of Teach for America DC. She began her career in education as a middle school Spanish teacher in the South Bronx, and she earned her bachelor's degree in international relations and master's degree in leadership from Georgetown University. Josephine Robinson is the chief of the Office of Family and Public Engagement for the DC Public Schools. And she leads DCPS's work to support parents and families, foster community partnerships, and spearhead community engagement efforts. Prior to joining DCPS, Robinson served as vice president of income and community impact with United Way Worldwide and was a senior administration appointee at the US Department of Health and Human Services. In 2001, she served in the White House as executive assistant to the chief of staff, Andrew H. Card Jr., and later as an associate director for healthcare outreach in the Office of Public Liaison. Robinson is a proud DCPS parent and grandparent, and she holds a bachelor's degree in international relations and politics from the Georgetown University School of Foreign Service. And so before I ask our illustrious guests to come join me on the stage, we'd like to show you a video that talks about the accomplishments of our two guests and of the DC public schools. Just thinking back to, to the school system when I first came in, it was kind of a hodgepodge of old ideas and um, outdated strategies. And it was really, I couldn't identify a direction. I didn't feel very welcome. I didn't know what was going on in the school building. I stepped into the number one role at a time where teacher morale was low. Um, the community was coming off of a number of school closings and there was a lot of really negative change happening. And I had to figure out a way to keep the momentum going so that we could continue really rapid change but do it in a way that um, the community and our employees were with us and not against us. So we use the term human capital as shorthand for great people. 
So when I think about human capital, I think about the opportunities we have to grow our own talent, the opportunities we have to create um, professional growth and really professionalize education. DCPS has done a great job in making sure that teachers have the opportunity to grow and that teachers, when they're working hard, they're compensated for that work, they're recognized for that work, and they also have leadership opportunities as well. We've been so busy making excuses for our young people that we've tended to set the bar low, and that's garbage, frankly. We know that if we set the bar high, they'll rise to it. There are curricular resources that um, are driving rigor of the content that every student is exposed to. When I first started teaching, we had a set of textbooks. I didn't even have enough of those, and I literally was going kind of page to page versus having some smart, cohesive, sequence of, um, of standards that I'm teaching that scaffold and build student learning. I know I'm being challenged when I feel that I got to push harder. I always say we are DCPS and we can do this, but we can't do it alone. It takes partnership with our stakeholders, our most important people, uh, our students, our families, and our community members. The fact that the teachers and the administration of DCPS care about every student is huge comfort to parents. And I believe that Kaya Henderson honestly believes that parent input is as valuable a tool for helping children succeed that there is. I'm a firm believer in that it takes a village to raise a child. And the school is now part of my village, has become the teachers, the principal, Mr. Cartland, they've become part of my village. Enrollment is up after 40 years of enrollment decline. Our graduation rates are up. Our national test scores are up. Um, you know, all of the, the indicators are pointing in the right direction. Student satisfaction is up. Teacher retention is up. Uh, and we're no longer a broken school district. But by virtually every measure, D.C. has improved faster than any other city in the nation. And the sense of momentum, um, the hope, the pride, the optimism that exists um, simply would have been impossible to think about 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. Now I feel like there's a very clear vision for where we're going and what we're doing. I feel like there's a positive energy about what's been accomplished, about um, the trajectory that our students are on, that our teachers are on. Five years from now, my major desire, my wish, is to become a lawyer, but I think I'm going to be ready. I'm going to be ready. And with DCPS, I've seen over the last five years a metamorphosis of trust and um, transparency. So five years ago, um, I think nobody would have been able to predict how much progress we've made in such a short amount of time. I want us to be the national model for what a great urban education looks like in America. I'd like to welcome Kaya Henderson and Josephine Robinson to the stage. So one of the things I'd like to start with, because we don't often get to hear the trajectory story from people who are in these roles. So I wanted to start uh, with you, Kaya, and then Josephine to follow, to tell us about your trajectory to the chancellorship in DC Public Schools. Sure enough, a very unlikely trajectory, <laughs> a non-traditional tra trajectory. Um, as you mentioned, I started out as a Teach for America alum. Teach for America's in a room. Thank you, don't be ashamed. Um, <laughs> I started out as a Teach for America Corps member in the South Bronx, teaching middle school Spanish. Uh, after my two years, I became convinced that every single college student in America should do Teach for America. I might have been wrong about that, but I was filled with zeal and fervor, and so I became a recruiter for the organization. Uh, I was promoted to National Director of Admissions after a year of recruiting. 
Um, and at the time, it was probably one of the most important jobs at Teach for America, because if we didn't recruit 500 at the time core members, then there would be no Teach for America, so no pressure. Um, I went from doing that for three years to running Teach for America DC. Wendy Kopp asked me to go uh, back to Washington. I had been in Washington for undergrad at Georgetown. She asked me to go back to um, support the DC office, which at the time was very small. And that began my love affair with DC public schools. Um, I supported the core in DC for three and a half years and then uh, moved on. I actually almost ended up here at Harvard, which I don't think many people know, um, but I was interested in the urban superintendent program, not because I ever wanted to be a superintendent, um, but because I wanted to understand what superintendents were learning and why they were not focusing on human capital as the key strategy for uh, moving student achievement. Um, but I got snatched up by a job at the New Teacher Project, and I was there for seven years, and it was amazing. I got to work with school districts all across the country, helping them think about how to get and keep great people. And then in 2007, when Michelle Ree was asked to come be the chancellor of DC Public Schools, she asked if I would go as her deputy chancellor, and I said yes. And then in 2010, when she left DC Public Schools, uh, I got the very lucky opportunity to stick around and move into the chancellorship, and it's been the most amazing five years of my life. Mm -hmm. Now, did you always <laughs> think that being chancellor was something you wanted to do when they asked you? Did you say, yippee, yay? You know, <laughs> what, what, what was your reaction? Uh, being chancellor was never something that I ever thought that I would like to do. When they asked me, I said, no, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I had a life. I had friends, <laughs> I was having a good time, and uh, I didn't want to give that up to be the leader of a, an urban school district, right? Um, I didn't see any urban school district leaders who I wanted to be. Um, I felt like they were challenged, you know, people scream at them all the time, the work is hard, and uh, I wasn't really interested, but because I had spent three years uh, attracting and retaining really good educators in the district. Um, they are the ones who said to me, well, we want you to stay. We'll stay if you stay. And the thought of watching all this talent leave the public schools, uh, where I fundamentally believe that any organization is only as good as the people in it. And so watching all of these really good people sharpen up their resumes and get ready to go um, was troubling to me. And um, they repeatedly, I mean, I got calls and emails from teachers and, and administrators who said, we'll stay if you stay. And so I stayed, and it's been awesome. Great. Thank you. Thank you. So, Josephine, tell us about your trajectory. Sure. Well, when you come out of school, you don't necessarily have a chief of family and public engagement as a job description role. Uh, so I have a very non-traditional path in that I am not an educator. Um, I did, I've never taught in a school, uh, and my career was plotted along the idea that I was going to be a foreign service officer, I was going to um, come out with my international relations and political degree, and you know, be an international player, if you will. Um, life was a little different when I got out, as in I got out, and I started a family immediately. I got married right out of school. Uh, and so it was very, it is a very different path that I would have to take. Um, and as my bio shared, uh, I've been in politics, though, for some time. I was first a lobbyist, uh, working in the pharmaceutical industry, hence the healthcare piece, um, which still doesn't make a whole lot of sense when you think that I have an international relations degree, but um, very much interested in the politics of what lobbying is and working and advocating for particular issues. And so when you think about that work, when you think about the work that I've done at the White House um, as a public liaison person, it is all about advocacy, outreach, engagement, issues. And I took that experience of doing those roles to my position at United Way, where I worked with the 1,200 plus United Ways across the country, and they were focused on uh, human services and uh, income stability within families. Uh, and so that work, again, it's policy work, it's national, it's about how do you take what is happening in communities and imbue it in policy 
and make certain that the things that you do as an organization are reflective of what a community needs. And so that set of skills, if there is any, that's transferable. And so when I got the call uh, from my good friend, uh, Kaya Henderson, to say, we, we need somebody with your set of experiences who knows how to talk to people, who knows how to listen, who knows how to actually take what people care most about and transfer it into the policymaking experience. Um, that is actually what spoke to me. But first and foremost, I'm a parent. Um, my children have been in DC public schools since 1995. So this is, I have 20 years of DC public school experience. So first and foremost, I'm a parent who's experienced the entire evolution of what DC public schools has been, what we are and where we're going. And so that's the experience that I bring to the role that I believe that um, Chancellor Henderson saw in tapping somebody like me, somebody who could take the personal set of skills that were needed to transform policy, but also having lived in a system uh, and wanting and needing something better uh, for my children and experiencing it firsthand. Uh, as a parent, as a PTA uh, president, um, I served for a number of years in my neighborhood school in that role. And so, again, I might not have come out of school with a degree in education or worked in a school, uh, but having lived in and through it and worked in communities, uh, I believe that I bring a set of skills that help uh, the, the, the district do the work that it needs to do on behalf of our families. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you both. And so what I'd like to do now is you talked about where DC has been, and I wanted to talk about when you took on the role of chancellor, uh, what was the state of play between the community, families, and DCPS when you came into the role of chancellor? It was an interesting time. Um, in 2007, when I started at DCPS as deputy chancellor, we met a school district and a community that was really tired of dysfunction and demanding something different. That's the best case scenario, right? When you have your politicians and your community members who are like, we want something different, we want something better. That gives you a platform on which you can do a lot of stuff. And uh, I think under the leadership of uh, Michelle Ree and then Mayor Adrian Venti, we did a lot of stuff. Uh, we did a lot of stuff. We did a lot of stuff really quickly. We did a lot of stuff um, that was very radical uh, or radically different than what previously had been happening. And to be very honest, we did it without engaging the community. And so um, the community felt like school reform was happening to them. Um, teachers felt like school reform was happening to them. And um, in some cases, people were good with it. In lots of cases, people were not. And what I've learned over time is even if you have the best ideas in the world, um, if people aren't with you, then those ideas won't stick. And those ideas sometimes never, ever get the chance to see the light of day again. And so when I came into the chancellorship in 2010, um, it was a very difficult time. People were tired of school reform. We don't want school reform. This is for the birds. People have been fired. Um, we had closed schools and um, done it in really one of the most disrespectful ways possible to the community. Uh, I think my like all-time low of being in DC public schools was um, in 2008, when we were closing 26 schools, we were required to have a meeting at every single school that we were going to close. And uh, under the direction of the mayor, uh, we had 26 meetings, all on the same night, all at the same time, and it snowed. And we should have canceled, and uh, we didn't. And if you were at a meeting, there were a group of us sitting on the stage, and if people said, why are you closing my school? Our response was, we're not here to answer questions this evening. We're here to just hear your perspective. And I'll never forget that evening. Um, I, it was, I mean, it just, it's not how I do business. It's not how I thought we should be doing business. Um, and people were really bitter about that set of closings. And I fast forward to 2013 when I was in the unenviable position of having to close 15 schools. Um, we did it in a completely different way. 
we did it in a way that engaged the community and involved the community um, and made them partners in this really tough decision that nobody wants to make. Um, but by engaging the community, we came to much better decisions. Um, it was the same time that Chicago was closing schools and they had the big strike. It was the same time that Philadelphia was closing schools and they had people chained to the superintendent's office. And in DC, we had a very smooth set of school closings because we asked the community what they wanted. They helped us figure out the right solutions and then we gave them what they asked for on the other side. And, you know, I say all the time, I'm a lover, not a fighter. I think you can fight your way to change, um, but that doesn't last very long. And I think if you want sustainable change, um, successful change, you have to do it with people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so, Josephine, what do you remember about when Chancellor Henderson first came in? You say you were a parent, and so just before you entered or just as you entered, what were some of the things that you were noticing about the state of play? between the, the system and the community? So uh, prior to uh, Chancellor Henderson assuming the, the role, um, I had somewhat disassociated from the school community. I was no longer a PTA parent. Uh, I was involved as it was with my children in particular. I had taken a step back from being engaged in the larger school community conversations. Uh, Why? Why? Uh, one, because there was so much change and turmoil in my immediate schools. Um, the neighborhood schools that I had sent my children to, uh, by the time it got to my third child, I have three children. Um, the two older children have seven and nine years age difference between the younger, but they had all gone to the neighborhood school. By the time my third child got to the neighborhood school, uh, they were on their fourth or fifth principal. Uh, and that was not um, something that uh, instilled a lot of confidence uh, in me and the, and the turnover, the churn, uh, is, was disruptive, is disruptive um, in communities. And so I lost confidence in the district as a whole. Um, and so I relied upon myself as, an in, as a parent who was looking out for her own child and disengaged and made different choices about where my children um, were going to go to school. And we tried different things. We actually left. Um, one, one of my children wound up going to a, to a Christian school. Um, and that was, a, that was a special, that was a choice that we made uh, because of the disruption, if you will. Now, fast forward to, um, to Michelle Ree and, and Kaya Henderson, and there was confidence being built in at least the change that was happening. I started to see that um, school leaders were speaking and speaking differently. Teachers were being paid. Um, that was one of the things that we heard, the, the, the fact that school didn't open on time, uh, that my kids didn't have schedules on day one, and then over time uh, with this new leadership, I started to see that. So I started to regain some confidence. And so by the time I got the call, there were, there were things that had changed in the system that were visible to me as a parent who was not as engaged but knew that things were changing. Um, and so I could, again, put myself forward. Um, and I wanted to be a part of the change that I knew that was coming because I knew the work that was going into the school and I couldn't sit back uh, and not, not participate. Uh, that's not my nature, if you will. If you want change, you have to be a part of the change. Mm -hmm. So we have Chancellor Henderson, you coming to the district, you recognizing that there was a real disconnect between the community families and the district. So what were the things that you did uh, at the beginning of your chancellorship to sort of change this dynamic? Um, so I spent a lot of time out in the community uh, with our families, with our teachers. I did um, teacher listening sessions. I did living rooms uh, where you just go and you sit down with a group of parents and hear from them about what's important to them. Um, and yeah, I just spent a lot of time talking to people and rebuilding relationships. Um, but more importantly, I think taking the ideas that I was hearing from my stakeholders and incorporating them into the work that we did. Um, it was important to me when I came on in 2010, 
there was, all, we lived or died by our test scores, right? And so if test scores were up, it was a good year, and people said DCPS were, was great. And if test scores went down or stayed flat, it was terrible, and nothing was happening. And so I wanted people to understand that to do this work, you, you can't look at what happens year by year, right? You need to look out over a time trajectory. And so uh, we got busy thinking about how we set forth a five-year strategic plan. And whereas most school districts will hunker down with the leadership in the school district and put together their strategic plan with some consultants and whatnot, uh, we took a different approach. And we asked our stakeholders, where do you want to see DCPS five years from now? What are your hopes and dreams for the school district? And we did a hopes and dreams campaign where we put boxes and postcards and whatnot in every single school. and. Um, we had an engaged DCPS website where people could go on and talk about what they wanted to see for their kids, for their schools, for the city. Uh, and <clears throat> we took the data from, and we had more than 10,000 people who participated in the Hopes and Dreams campaign, and we took that feedback and we used that to build our strategic plan. Um, so we weren't deciding what we wanted to focus on. We took our marching orders for the next five years from what our families and our community members wanted to see in the school district. And I think when we announced this five-year strategic plan, um, there are the things that you would expect to be there, like increases in test scores or increases in graduation rate. Uh, but it was also important um, to our families that their children feel safe and happy in their schools. And so one of our big five goals is that 90% of our young people will love their school. And when we're talking about our five goals and I get to that goal, people chuckle. And it's very serious for us. I have kids in DC public schools. I have one left, one graduated, praise God. Um, <laughs> but I have a fourth grader and um, he spends more time in school than he spends with me. And so I want him to be happy. I want him to feel safe and affirmed and encouraged. I want to develop his talents in addition to his test scores. And so that is serious for us. It's not a nice to have, and it's what our families want. It's what we want for our young people. Um, so we built our strategy around what our families said they wanted after doing a lot of listening. And then we checked back with our families regularly before we make any big decision. Uh, we roll it out to our parent cabinet, roll it out to our teacher cabinet, roll it out to our principal cabinet. I used to have a student cabinet. Um, that's coming back. Um, but we ask people before we do big things or when we had big problems like the need to close schools or the need to redraw the boundaries, we took the data to our people and said, look, this is what we're confronted with. What would you do? so that I'm not the one coming up with the answers. And I said to my team, let's put together our best thinking. We'll call, it's a proposal, but don't get married to it because um, we have some data, but our communities have other data that we don't have. And when we put our data together with their data, we'll get to the best solutions. And sometimes that's hard for educators to hear or to accept that we aren't the only experts, um, that some people might know more things than we do, um, but what I found is when you engage the community around those tough decisions um, and when they see their thinking reflected in the outcomes, um, you can literally conquer anything together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when you did this Hopes and Dreams Tour, I love that, I love that name, um, campaign, what were a couple of the things that the family said that they wanted that you all uh, integrated into your strategic plan? So as I said, families said they wanted their kids to feel safe and happy in school. Um, and so we have a goal around that and we've put money into student satisfaction um, strategies so that schools could do whatever. We actually survey our students and ask them, you know, do you love your school? Do you love your teachers? What could be better? Blah, blah, blah. And we've applied money to deal with the issues that they raise. Um, our school said they want, Washington DC is an international city and they wanted their young people to be prepared um, to live and work in a globalized economy. And so we had some things that we were doing, they were great things, the embassy adoption program, where embassies partner with some of our schools um, to give kids an international experience at home, we radically expanded that so that more kids get the opportunity to do that. We're raising money to provide all of our young people at DCPS with an international experience. 
Um, I took 10 young men to Croatia last year. I'll take 10 young women this year. Um, our family said they wanted art and music and PE and foreign language, and they wanted uh, an education that addresses the whole child. And so we put our money there. And every single school, elementary, middle, and high school, um, our elementary schools are required to provide art, music, PE, foreign language library um, at a time when we watch school districts across the country stripping those things away from the academic programming. Um, and so when, when, when you give parents what they ask for, um, then parents are with you. Parents will go to the city council and fight for more money for you uh, when you don't get all of the money that you want, or they'll support, you know, scream at the mayor and say, give Kaya more of what she needs. I like that. Um, <laughs> uh, but we've, we've literally been very lucky to have the whole city um, supporting us, I think, because the politicians see our outreach. Um, and it, it doesn't mean that we can do everything that everybody asks for. Let me be very clear. Um, but if we do enough of what our families ask for that we think are good for all kids, um, then we can get to some successes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, you know, and for both of you, you know, uh, I do a lot of work around the country where I talk to districts about this. And one of the things I hear, the pushback is, but doesn't this approach take a long time? I mean, if we've <laughs> got to talk to all these community people and all these families, I mean, we got to move fast. I mean, we're, this, this is going to slow us down. What, what would you say uh, to that response about engaging the community and families? To go, f I mean, the title of this seminar is mm -hmm. if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, you go together. Sometimes the urgency is just that urgent, but you leave people behind, and then the work that you've done is no longer sustainable. It's no longer... Um, felt as if they had a role in it, uh, and that is critically important. Uh, sometimes you have to take a step back to go forward, uh, and that's what's what we've seen with the work that we've done. When you take the time to help people understand uh, why you're doing something, when you've taken the time to listen to the input, when you've been transparent with what you know, when you know it, it hits people exactly where um, where they need. Uh, to know that this is the right thing and they go with you and they champion it and they show up and they show out uh, which is what we've seen and so, in good ways in good way in very good ways uh, they used to show out in not so good ways <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's reflective in our community meetings and discussions where people are showing up and they are giving us real tangible information because they know that we take it we listen to it and they see it reflected in the results, and we show them. We're deliberate about showing them what we've done. So it's not just saying it, it's showing um, what we've done with the information and the investments that people have made with their time, talent, and efforts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think if, if people don't recognize the importance of doing the slow, messy work of engaging families, then they've got to know that whatever they do is short-lived at best. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know how else to explain it. When a teacher is trying to move a kid who's struggling and the teacher is doing that by themselves, it's a different situation than when a teacher is trying to move a struggling kid and a parent is helping, right? Um, we all do better when we're working together. And so um, I, I think this whole, I think the urgency thing is a red herring. I think it's a red herring. I think it's being used to scapegoat or to attack people who don't share your view or your strategy. Um, well, we got you. You don't understand how urgent this problem is, right? We're talking about people whose children are in your schools. Of course, they understand how urgent this problem is, but it doesn't give you license to just roll over, folks, right? Um, I also think that you know one of the most important parts of leadership is change management, and you have to be clear about how much change people can take at any one time. And I think we had been in a situation in DCPS where um, there was too much change. And if we kept going really fast, um, and if we kept being so urgent, um, we were in danger of losing the whole entire thing. And I think there are examples of that across the country, where superintendents went too fast and didn't have people with them, and now they're unemployed. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm good about job security. I can find another gig. 
but <laughs> I think you know you don't do this work and you know make the sacrifices of time from away from family and stress and all kinds of things to watch it all go backwards because you mishandled how much change people can take. Um, so I think it's really important to always have your ear to the ground, to know where your people are, and to have a dynamic tension between you know, pushing fast, but also understanding when too much is too much. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Were there any key seminal moments for uh, either one of you when you were doing this family and community engagement work that really hit you and you said, wow, this is, this is where it's at. Was there a moment or a, a personal story that you could share about that? I think the moment that you hear, and I will generalize a little bit, a parent say, a teacher came into my home and they just listened to me and they heard you know, all the great things about my, my child and nobody judged me. Uh, and I feel connected in a way that I haven't been before, and that's in large part what our home visit uh, family engagement work has been able to do is establish trust and relationships. So it's been, st I still get caught in my breath when I listen to a parent, you heard one of our parents, Keisha Cox, um, on the video talk about the village, if you will, and we get these stories um, every day uh, from these families who say how transformative it is just because someone in that school, particularly their child's teacher, has taken the time to get to know them, to get to know their child, and to call them a partner, um, and see them as somebody who has value um, to the, uh, the entire educational experience. That's transformative um, for us as a district, but, uh, but I think it, it hits me every single time when I hear those stories. Mm -hmm. Um, I think a low transformative moment was that night when we did 26 um, <laughs> meetings all together. It just didn't feel right to me. Um, and um, it didn't feel the way I would have liked to be treated um, if I was on the, the receiving end of that. Um, I think um, a different transformative moment uh, was when we came here to Harvard for PELP, uh, the Public Education Leadership Project, and I brought my entire team, and you have to bring a problem of practice to the table. And the problem that we brought was family engagement, uh, because we knew that we needed to do something very different. And what Harvard gave us was the time and space as a team to really reflect on what we had done, to ask ourselves hard questions about um, why family engagement wasn't working um, and what we needed to do different and differently. And we came away from this week together, um, and Karen Mapp wasn't even our facilitator, <laughs> but uh, we came away from this week together having a very different idea about family and community engagement. Um, what we figured out was a lot of previous efforts in DCPS that we continued, because they were in place, we're trying to fix parents, mm -hmm. right? Well, they don't all read as well as they need to to be able to help their kids, so we're gonna teach them to read, or you know, we need to help them get their taxes done, because then that's one less thing for them to worry about, and they could focus on homework. And we were trying to fix parents, and parents come in this wide range of varieties and types, um, none of which could we really we couldn't address all of those issues. And uh, we came away saying, well, if we, like, what would we do differently if we were not trying to fix parents? And we asked ourselves, what do parents care about? Well, they care about their kid first and foremost, right? Um, and at a district level, what the district is doing sort of matters, maybe kind of, but what really matters is what's happening with their kid in that kid's classroom. And who's the most important person who can drive that movement? The teacher. So how do we get teachers as the front lines of family engagement? Not Josephine's office and the 15 people in the district, but how do we get teachers to drive a different relationship with families? And then what do parents care about secondarily? They care about the school community that their student is in. 
and we see parents are willing to do lots for this school community. We have educators, principals, who don't know how to ask parents for help. In fact, um, our educators, not just ours, but across the field, you know, feel like, well, we're the experts. Parents, just drop off your kids, and we got this. And so we've had to re-educate uh, educators across the school community about how they partner with parents and how to invite parents into the school building and how to ask them for the kind of help that we need. And so we just reoriented our thinking, um, I think, from a, a away from a deficit perspective way of thinking about parents, that they were problems to be fixed, um, and moving to an assets-based uh, way of thinking about parents as partners, uh, valuable assets that could help us do our work better. And even after we had that epiphany, it took a while to figure out how to put the structures in place. Uh, we were fortunate enough to work with a great foundation because school districts are doing 750 things. And so we knew that we wanted to do something different around family engagement, but we didn't have the time or the capacity to figure out what best practices were. And so we were able to engage a local foundation who went out and scoured the country to figure out what the best practices were in parent engagement and brought that back to us. And then we were able to build structures and build capacity in our schools and with our educators to be the front lines of family engagement. And it has been totally transformative. And is that the work with the Flamboyant Foundation? Yes. It is. Could you talk a little bit about, so you, you came to Pelham, I remember that, and I remember sitting in on the presentation from DC and saying, wow, this is fabulous. Um, could you talk a little bit about some of the specific initiatives, both uh, that you did with your teachers going into the homes, but you know, one of the things that I was fortunate enough to be able to do was work with the Department of Ed and collaborate with them on the dual capacity framework for family uh, and school partnerships. And so one of the things we talk about is different initiatives that have to be put in place to build the capacity of staff. So could you talk about some of the things, some of the actual initiatives that came out of that work? Sure, if you want to talk about a bit more specific. Sure, so again, in partnership with the Flamboyant Foundation, they did go across the country and they um, determined that the home visit uh, model was one of the most effective ways of driving um, change within a school and their school culture and creating partnerships um, between parents and, 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 and teachers um, in the classroom. And so that's the, the principal um, uh, foundational aspect of the work is they train teachers uh, to effectively establish relationships with parents in their schools and know how to go into um, a relationship by talking first with families and and invite and being invited into their homes or wherever the, the parent is comfortable and just getting to know um, these parents what their hopes and dreams are for their child who their child is and they often do this work over the course of the summer in advance of the school year um, so that they can create a foundation um, of trust if you will so that the first uh, call the first letter the first communication with the family is not something that their child did wrong but it's it's a reinforcement of um, some positive things that they've learned or done uh, with, with their child over the course of um, teaching them throughout the school year. But it's been established through these home visits um, and on the front end. Uh, they also work with the families to transform the parent-teacher conference. Oftentimes, parents um, either don't go for a variety of reasons or the, they don't get the best use out of a parent-teacher conference. They're not often, some parents are not often equipped um, with information about how to make the best use of, of um, these conversations with teachers about their child's progress. And so these academic parent-teacher team meetings um, are a new model where the entire class um, of families uh, come together and they, they work together looking at the progress of the class as a whole and parents are given information about their individual child's um, progress somewhat uh, compared against the rest of the class uh, in a, um, uh, it's confidential, so they get a number and they can track their child's progress against the other students in the class. But that actual ability to see where their child is in comparison to others and to know what is being taught in the school uh, is something that is helpful to a parent to better understand their child's academic trajectory, but also they come away equipped with tools um, and information so that they can go home and support their child's learning. And so they often teach these small 
um, lessons to, to parents with little tricks, if you will, um, that they can take home with them. And so that's been really effective in helping parents understand what's happening during the school day and figuring out how to actually help their child at home in small ways. It's not making them be teachers, if you will. They're not asking them to do their jobs, but they're asking them to support the learning. And that work is just one piece um, of, of, the, of the framework within Flamboyant. We also look to, we have to train the teachers to be able to do this. And so the Flamboyant Foundation in partnership with staff in my office actually coach um, teachers on how to have effective conversations and how to share information um, with families so that they're not left out on their own to figure this out. The teachers work um, in pairs um, with another co-teacher uh, and so they're, they're oftentimes building a cohort or a community um, in their schools and there's a whole school model, a whole school can do this uh, work together or we've set it up where if the whole school isn't ready to do every single teacher um, in a school, we allow teachers to learn the same aspects of doing this work as part of a fellowship um, called the Family Engagement Collaborative and all of this is in partnership with the Flamboyant Foundation. Um, but it is, to not overuse that word, it is transformational. Um, teachers who participate want to participate. Um, they tell us in surveys that this has helped them. It might be a bit more work on the front end, but they gain from investing the time and energy in establishing relationships such that it, again, changes their class culture, changes the set of expectations. The kids are excited um, about, oh, my teachers come um, to see me at home. They got to see my trophies. They got to see my artwork. They got to see um, what I did. And that, that's actually um, really shown significant results um, in a number of our schools. We've also looked at really everything that we do to figure out how do we ensure that parents are more engaged. So how do we get information out? Uh, we use digital grade books at our secondary level so that parents can go on to Engrade or Blackboard and see their young people's progress. Um, we heard from parents that um, report cards were hard to decipher and so we went back and redid our report cards, although parents are now telling us we need to redo them again, that's okay, we'll <laughs> keep at it. But one of the important features was telling parents on the report card what they could be doing, um, what books their kids should be reading, what books their kids should be reading to them, what books they should be reading together, what books they could be reading to their youngster um, to help move you know, um, the reading levels or, you know, we've put information out. We now have a, a standardized curriculum across DC public schools, which was not the case previously. And now because every family can expect to experience the same set of things across the city, we were able to create parent guides where parents can click on an app, an app that was designed by our high school students, which is kind of cool. Um, and they can click on their kid's grade level and see what their young people are studying this month in math or in English or in social studies or in science. And there are tips around what field trips around the city uh, would be great to support this particular kind of work and there are discounts that go along with that and whatnot. Um, you know, we've thought a lot about how we ensure that parents know that we want them to be participants in their children's learning and exploration, and we don't think that we can do it by ourselves. I say all the time, we are DCPS and we can do this, but we can't do it by ourselves. We can only do it in cooperation with our families. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And could you talk a little bit about how you are working with your school leaders? Because as we all know, the school leaders can make or break the family yeah. engagement work and the community engagement work. So. Uh, you know, I know when uh, I was talking at lunch to Chancellor Henderson and Josephine about when I was in Boston, I mean, we had principals like Bill Henderson, who was sitting over here to my right, who were very, very good at engaging families, but not everybody was all <laughs> that excited about doing that. So what, what kinds of things have you done to really cultivate that kind of culture? So I'll give two examples. One for aspiring principals. We train our own principals. Uh, we have a a program called the Mary Jane Patterson Fellowship. Mary Jane Patterson was the first African American principal in DC public schools and we've named our principal training program after her and a significant part of that training uh, is family engagement. The 
work that Josephine talked about, the home visit work, the academic parent team teacher meeting work, the how do you create a school culture that is welcoming to parents. We actually train our aspiring principals on that work so that when they become principals, they have the skill set, the capacity, and a disposition to do family engagement work, and they don't have to be convinced to do it. Um, for our sitting principals, uh, I think we do two things. One is, you know, you start with the coalition of the willing, right? Mm -hmm. And the principals who are into this um, will take it and run with it. And then you put them in front of their peers to talk about the work. And when, you know, your colleague is getting outsized results in student achievement, um, and attendance is up and truancy is down and you know all kinds of good things are happening and you're saying to your colleague you know how'd you do this and your colleague is explaining that family engagement is key then you're more apt to listen to your colleague than you are to a central office administrator telling you why you need to do this mm -hmm. um, the other thing that we do with our principals our sitting principals is support them as they try to do this work um, we have a, a changing cityscape in Washington, D.C., uh, where there are lots of new families um, and there are tensions between older families and new families and principals are having to lead in changing neighborhoods and changing environments. And a couple of years ago, our principals were kind of in the middle of these clashes of different cultures and they said we need some help. And so we contracted with some people who are pretty expert in um, helping leaders deal with issues of diversity, race, class, and not running away from those issues, but uh, providing our principals with the support that they need to be able to have difficult conversations or to be able to help their school community understand that all types of families are valuable. And so we pay money to consultants who are smart about this stuff to create professional learning communities amongst our principals and to support them and coach them as they take on this mm -hmm. kind of work. Well, you had actually told a story about a particular school. Yeah. And and I and I would love for you to share that story with our audience because I thought sure. it was very powerful. Yeah, uh, Powell Elementary School. It was the school that you saw in the video in the opening uh, credit. And Powell, a couple of years ago, maybe four years ago, we were going to close. There were only about 130 students there. Families were fleeing the district, and. Um, we put a new principal into Powell uh, who really uh, was um, engaged with the community, um, built credibility in the community, and got families um, to come back to Powell. Powell now has 600 students, um, and it's an elementary school. And um, what, what initially Powell uh, student body was primarily low-income African-American and Latino students and we had a dual language program there that had languished but the new principal really built up the dual language program um, she made families feel welcome and so a larger base of families started to come but so did new families um, new families to the neighborhood people who would never have considered living in the that neighborhood before and we're seeing a lot of that um, in Washington DC real issues around gentrification real issues around competing demands and so you had these two sets of families that were active in the school you had the largely african-american and latino families who would come and volunteer during the school day or bring food or provide support in very physical tangible ways and then you had a new population um, of more upper and upper middle class families who felt like the best way to support was to raise money for schools, right? And that's what they were good at. And so God bless them, they raised some money for the schools. But then you had this conflict because the parents who were contributing time and effort felt like they were, their, their contributions were less than the money people. And the money people felt like their contributions were much more important, <laughs> as money people often do. <laughs> um, and so we had to work with the principal to help her navigate the fact that all of these families are valuable. Part of what makes Powell the vibrant, diverse place that it is is that we've got all of these dynamics happening. And so our team, Josephine's team, literally 
went to every single PTA meeting and we realized that you've got to have PTA meetings in the daytime and in the evening times because it's inconvenient for one set or the other and you know really sat in the principal's office and helped her work through some of these challenging things it's slow it's messy it doesn't you don't just flip a switch and it happens it's relationship building right, right? and if you're going to build relationships you have to spend time with people and you have to help communicate to them that they're valued and right as we were at the crescendo of this work the principal mm, got married got pregnant had a baby and had to move to spain oh my goodness which is great for her <laughs> but not literally good not good for this school community and we worked with the school community to bring all of these people together and say, what what do you want in a new principal? What is, what is important? And so they put together a committee. We have community panels when we select new principals. And they selected a very diverse community panel that represented all of the different kinds of parent groups. Mm -hmm. And they chose a principal. And it was a big thing because the principal um, didn't doesn't speak Spanish and it's a very heavily dual language school but they all agreed that she was the right person and now we've seen even after the old principal left we've seen an in continued increases in enrollment there are some families who felt like the new principal wasn't gonna give them their sway um, and so some of them left um, but more people have come and we've been intentional about creating this community, but supporting this community and muddling through it with this community and helping the principals, both of them, do that. And that's the kind of commitment that you have to make to this work. And when your teachers see that, then your teachers who go on to be administrators in some cases or sometimes go to other schools will carry that commitment with them. And that's what we're trying to infuse across the district. I say all the time, I'm not the chancellor of the rich people or new people coming to town. I'm not the chancellor of the old people. I'm the chancellor of all people. And so I've got to figure out, and we have to figure out ways to make sure that everybody knows that they're welcome and valued and part of the work that we're doing. So what I'd like to do now is to give you all a chance to uh, write down a question. And did everybody get an index card? We have index cards for you. And so uh, I'm going to continue. I'm going to ask another question, but I'd like you to be thinking about a question. And then as uh, you write them down, to pass them to the ends. And then we'll take some of your questions, OK? So could you both talk about some of the outcomes of this work? So you know, that's always the question. If we do this work, uh, Where's the beef? You know, what, what, what are we going to see in terms of, of outcomes? So could you talk about the outcomes? So the family engagement work in particular, we just uh, had released about two weeks ago an evaluation from Johns Hopkins University of uh, the home visit work that we've done. And that study followed 12 of our uh, 22 schools, um, and they absolutely um, controlled for race, socioeconomic class, what have you, so that the results were not ones that would lean one way or another based on the student population, but across the board they were able to see that the results from the home visit work in these schools uh, resulted in 24% increase in student attendance. And students who received home visits were 1.55% um, uh, more proficient, if you will, in uh, reading, reading proficiency. And so there are some real results that we are able to now um, uh, pin to this work. And that's pretty challenging to do, is to find this uh, quantitative versus qualitative um, results uh, fr from this work. But it's, it's more than promising. It's a proof point um, that this is meaningful um, efforts that we've undertaken that actually come with results. So we're really proud of that. I think, um, <clears throat> you know, Tom Strike, the parent who you saw, who said, I really believe that Kaya Henderson thinks parent engagement is important, like I actually do. And I think that is ha that has been communicated to parents, um, and they have in return demonstrated their trust in the district. For 40 years, DCPS saw consecutive years of declining enrollment. Um, until five years ago when we stabilized. And over the last four years, we've grown DCPS's enrollment by 10%. 
Um, that's huge in a city where there's a new charter school opening every 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. Um, so we have regained the trust of families, and families are voting with their feet and coming to DCPS in part because um, they see themselves as part of the work that we're doing. Um, you know, across all dimensions, our graduation rates are up, our test scores are up, um, student satisfaction is up, teacher retention is up, and I think all of those have been touched by um, this different level of and way of engaging with families and community members. Uh, we're not the fastest improving urban school district because we're so smart or we're so cute. It's because <laughs> we've put clear strategies in place and we've engaged our community and our families with helping us execute on those strategies. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, so while they're collecting the cards, if we can get them to come forward, obviously we're not gonna get to <laughs> ask all of the questions that are in there. Mm -hmm. I, I suspect some of them are similar, but um, I'm gonna ask two of my wonderful students to take, take a look and, and pull out some for us. Are there others that we can put in the basket? Um, I'm gonna ask another question before we go to the audience question. So when you think about the ed school, places like schools of education, like this wonderful one that we sit in right now, what would be your advice to us in terms of how do we cultivate this kind of proficient practice in, in family and community engagement? What, what would your advice be to us and other teacher or principal preparation or superintendent preparation programs? I mean, first, teach it. Um, I think, you know, we had John King uh, with us yesterday who is the incoming Secretary of Education. He was talking about some of his challenges as a teacher and how, you know, he wanted to engage families, but he didn't know how, and he went back to his you know, uh, teacher prep program and realized that he didn't have a class in family engagement. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think if we want teachers to engage with families, we've learned you have to teach them how to do it. Um, and there are very clear best practices, and so I think um, ensuring that it's part of the fabric of how we teach teachers is really important. Otherwise, it becomes an add-on over mm -hmm. to the side, and I, I, that's not the right way. Um, I think it's also important for you all to, I mean, you do a great job of um, highlighting um, promising practices or best practices, and I think to the extent that you can continue to lift up places that are doing this family engagement work, um, it's really important. It's not just important from a research standpoint, um, but I'll tell you that uh, one of the things that I think was really damaging for a little while in, um, in the education leadership space was we were praising these leaders, like outsized praise for leaders who were just going fast and hard and take no prisoners, right? And what that did was then create a generation of people who believe that that's the way to lead, right? And people who were doing the slow, methodical work of building relationships and whatnot, nobody's paying attention to them, right? Um, and now people are like, oh, how did you do that, right? I think it's really important to send a message to the next set of leaders um, about how we want them to lead by highlighting and spotlighting um, the kind of work that we know is will, will bring folks to success, because I think we've sent the wrong messages to some people. Um, and then I think research, right? There are some people who won't do it unless they can qualify it, unless there's the data to back it up. And, uh, and that data can be testimonials from teachers, but it's also the hardcore thing like, you know, a 24% uh, reduction in ab absenteeism or, you know, one and a half times the chances of reading above grade level, which is what we're seeing out of our work. Um, I think all of those things are important. Um, but I, I mean, I also, I think that professors have incredible, incredible leverage with their young people, um, the students that they teach. And um, in the same way that we've had to figure out, how do we ensure that every department at DCPS is asking itself, you know, how does my work engage parents? Mm -hmm. I think every professor at Hugsy should be asking themselves, how does what they teach, um, how do they get their 
their students to think about the impact that this has on families and communities and ways that um, students can engage families and communities. Now my students do this, so I'm gonna do this for that one, right? Because that, that's certainly something that um, excites me. So, Dominique, we have a few questions. Take it to the people. Thank you. So, okay. So this question is related to uh, the answer that we just heard. So it says, a lot of the family engagement strategies mentioned rely heavily on teachers. Many teachers would like to do this work, but don't have the capacity to do so. And I think by capacity, they may mean in this question both, both their own internal capacity, but also time. Time, mm -hmm. yep. So how do you support and compensate teachers for their work with families outside of school? Mm -hmm. We support and compensate teachers for their work outside of school. We, we train them and we pay them for training. Uh, we also pay them per home visit. Uh, I don't know how much it is. How much? Yes, so they get uh, $34 an hour. So it's, uh, so it's two hours usually. So it's about 30 to, it's about 60 to $68 an hour uh, for the two hours that they spend outside. Um, but often our teachers tell us it's not the dollars. Frankly, um, I have um, the, the reports back from teachers and the surveys that they've provided that this work consistently um, creates efficiencies in their classrooms that they get back. So the time and investment that they put in to do this has an immediate return to them in terms of better lesson planning, frankly, behavior management in the classrooms. Um, um, you've seen, they've seen improvements there. So the dollars, I mean, nobody is saying don't pay me, um, <laughs> but uh, on the rating, it, it's not the highest rated thing yeah. um, that they say that they take away from this process. But it means you don't have to have a night job at Macy's, right? Mm -hmm. To make ends meet, because one, we pay you well generally as a teacher, but then we're also compensating you for the time that you would be at Macy's that we'd prefer that you are in your students' homes. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so here's another question. Um, this one is, is gets back to some of the things, Kaya, that you brought up around when you now have gentrification happening, but it's actually about um, your teacher and principal population. Um, we're gonna assume that it doesn't look exactly like the families that are served in the DC public schools in terms of the diversity. So how do you deal with um, issues of race, class, and equity to ensure that teacher bias or the bias of staff um, doesn't prohibit your family engagement work? I mean, yeah. Uh, welcome to how to solve race and class <laughs> issues in America. Mm -hmm. um, if I had the answer to that, I'd be making a lot more money than I'm making now. Um, I think, you know, um, one, um, the, the, the teaching and, and leading core in DCPS um, has undergone a lot of changes um, but it's still fairly diverse and way uh, more colorful and more representative of the young people we serve than most places. Um, but just because people are your color don't mean that they're your kind, is what my grandmother used to say. And so we find that we have to do the same work with people that look like and come from um, some of the neighborhoods that our young people do as we do with educators who don't. Um, I think key to it is not being afraid to have the conversation, not being afraid to put it on the table. When I think about what's happening across the country right now, it, look, last week was a tough week to be a university president. I was thinking, usually I'm like, whew, this week is a tough week to be a chancellor. Last night I was like, whew, I'll take chancellor. <laughs> university presidents are catching hell. Um, but, but they're catching hell because they don't want to have the conversation. Um, these issues are real, and they are what are our young people are facing every day, and they're what our educators are facing every day and trying to figure out. And we might not have the answers, but you can't get to the answers unless you're willing to have the conversation. Um, you know, we've been thoughtful about cultural competence, um, but we're struggling with how you do that in a way that is not just you go to the diversity workshop, right? Uh, which is how a lot of school districts check the box and say, I've trained teachers in cultural competence. Um, I think part of it is using the content. So we've been very thoughtful about 
um, with our curriculum, what texts our young people are exposed to. And sometimes that forces really difficult conversations with the teachers who are having to teach that text, who've never confronted um, some of their expectations or beliefs. But I think the key is to create a space where people can have those conversations, where even when people say things that might sound crazy or offensive, that we don't just jump down their throat and shut them down so that the space is no longer safe, but we say, look, that was whack, and let me tell you why, right? And keep the conversation open. Um, that's what we have to teach our young people to do. And if we can't do that as adults, our kids don't have a fighting chance. Um, it's hard and it's frustrating, but um, you have to, I think, you know, we're in the people development business. I say all the time, we take little people and make them good big people, but we also take big people and make them better big people. And that means um, valuing people enough to have the tough conversations or to not be in our feelings or to cut through some of the stuff and really try to get down to what people are trying to say. Um, and it's not comfortable and it's not easy, but anything worth doing is hard, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to remain committed. We have to create an organizational culture where we're okay talking about this stuff and where we're okay saying, I think your expectations for your kids might be a little out of whack. Mm -hmm. um, it's also about building systems. So I'll give you a very clear example. Um, so we go to this new curriculum. Before, everybody was teaching whatever they wanted to teach, as long as they said it pointed to the standards. Yeah, no. And so um, we created a curriculum that was aligned to the Common Core standards, in part because teachers said, I'm making stuff up and I don't feel comfortable. And I'm not sure that what I'm making up on this side of town is commensurate with what is happening on the other side of town. All right, so we put a curriculum in place. It's good. And so I go out on the first day of school two years ago, and I go see two first grade classes that are teaching the same lessons. They are on wildly different sides of town. One is east of the river, where our lowest income and most challenged families are. The other one is kind of mid-city, where there's all of this new activity happening. Um, and it same lesson, and one teacher was using the lesson to review um, to review hard consonants, to review the sounds of the letters, right, in first grade. And the other teacher was using the same lesson to have kids write essays about the topic. Now they're in first grade, so writing essays is, you know, was pre-writing, right? And sometimes there were three words on the page before you went to the next page, right? But it was writing and it was narrative. And, and my press secretary, who happened to be traveling with me, said, should first graders be sounding out letters? And I was like, yeah, no. Um, but what it conveyed to me is you could be teaching the very same lesson and have very different expectations for your young people. And so I went back to my academic team and I was like, okay, we thought we were all hot because we had a curriculum that was gonna ensure equity because people are teaching the same lessons. But in fact, educators' expectations about kids are killing that equity. So how do we without saying all kids can learn, because yep, everybody believes that, sort of. How do we actually force teacher practice to be different? And so <clears throat> we came up with this idea um, of projects that uh, interested engaging project-based lessons that look a little more like the writing exercise um, and challenge kids in real ways, um, and requiring that our teachers teach these lessons. Now, the way our curriculum is set up, um, the school year cover is covered by five units. Each unit has 30 to 35 days in it. And so what we said to teachers is we're going to take one to five of those days. The other 30 or so you can have to do what you want with the curriculum. But for one to five days, you're going to teach a project in each unit. And every teacher in the third grade in the city is going to be teaching the same project at the same time. And the lesson is gonna be designed by our highest performing teachers, the ones who get this, who have really high expectations for our young people and are, are developing lessons that like you wanna be in their classroom, right? You've been in these teachers' classrooms. You go in and you're supposed to be in for five minutes and you're like there for 30, right? And you can't stop talking about that lesson. Those teachers, we paid them over the summer to develop lessons for 
Um, so one for each unit, and then the fifth unit we have testing um, in every grade level and in every subject area. So every teacher now, ha whether they have high expectations for kids or not, they have a lesson in each unit, which really represents high expectations and is engaging. And we completely revamped our professional development schedule so that the district-wide professional development days are one where they happen after that lesson. And you bring your student work to the professional development day. And you're looking at your third graders' work with other people's third graders' work. And when other people's kids are going this deep and your kids are only going this deep, I don't have to tell you your expectations for your young people are off, right? You have to confront the harsh realities that other third graders are doing this level of work, and yours are only doing this level of work, and what are you gonna do differently? And so, in a peer sort of way, being driven by rigorous content, we are shifting teacher expectations about what their kids can accomplish. And teachers are saying, we want more cornerstone projects. Uh, we want two or three per unit, and we literally cannot produce them quickly enough. But it's a very mm. professional way, without attacking people personally around what they believe about kids and whatnot, but showing them what kids can do, again, by the peer effects and through rigorous content that we're shifting teacher expectations and putting teacher bias on ice. And you know we're not where we want to be, nobody is. But it's work that we are going to continue and that our teachers are receptive um, to doing. So what do you see as the top opportunity, but also the top threat to continue in the family engagement work and moving it forward? Top opportunity and top threat. Um, I don't want to call it a threat. Um, I think it's a continual challenge. Um, the opportunity and the challenge are one and the same. The opportunity is having these difficult conversations in communities as communities are changing. The challenge is having those same conversations in communities that are constantly changing and helping people understand that, the, the, that they're in this together, that they want very much the same things, but they have to learn to see each other and talk to one another. Uh, and just following on this whole conversation about bias and expectations that um, having the conversations are critical to moving forward as a school community. And so there's a real opportunity when we uh, bring people together and, have, and help them see um, that there's, real, um, there's, there's a real chance for them to grow as a whole school community with each other as opposed to fighting against or pushing their own personal agendas. Uh, and so that's what we have to do in the, in the community engagement piece. That's what happens when we go into school communities and do this very rigorous hands-on uh, work where we're at PTA meetings or at community meetings. And again, it is about how you actually talk to one another and understand um, that the goals and aspirations that this particular family has are very similar. If not, um, they're not alternate to what your expectations are. Um, they just come at it from a different perspective. And so I think, again, that's an opportunity and a challenge that should we really work hard together, both uh, within the school communities and central office, but the community as, as a whole, we will see some real change happen. Um, the excitement that we see from families is real. They want DCPS to succeed. They want the schools to succeed, um, but they can't do it without doing it together. Um, I think a couple of opportunities, she's telling you 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. There are a couple of opportunities. <laughs> I know. I <laughs> a couple see. of opportunities um, to be really creative in how we engage families. Um, we, with our parent curriculum guides, we were able to engage our students around designing an app that would work for families. That's kind of cool. Um, I think uh, we've seen a lot um, of, of the, um, of the uh, back to school nighty stuff uh, begin to morph into student-led conferences with their parents. And so I think there is a student empowerment and engagement and student advocacy opportunity um, that we could maximize um, by doing more in different family engagement. There are lots of, I think, neat technologically, de technological ways that we can um, continue to think about how we engage our families. 
Um, I think the threat, uh, there are twofold. One is time and the other is money. Um, the threat is that this is not work where you do it and all of a sudden there's a humongous return on investment immediately. It's work that you have to keep investing in. It means that you have to hire people who are willing to go out and build relationships. And lots of, I mean, every year, even if we get more money, it's less, right? Because the costs rise this much and your budget rises this much. And so still it's a net loss. And so every year we have to figure out how to keep the capacity that we've built. Um, every year we have to figure out how to get teachers more time um, to train on this stuff. Um, or more money because more teachers are doing home visits and we want to pay them. Um, and I think that, you know, the people who, um, who give us money for our budgets don't always necessarily understand, like, how you have to make investments over time in order to do this work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, what, this question is interesting, uh, how does mayoral control either help or hinder your family and community engagement work? Oh, uh, I thought you were going to ask a different question. Um, so I, I actually think that, um, and I you know, sort of alluded to this, you know, who your mayor is matters a lot in terms of how you do your business. And so when we had a mayor who thought community engagement was overrated, we had the night of 26 meetings. Um, when we had a mayor who um, really believed and supported our vision of engaging differently with the community, um, we were able to do very different things. Um, but like any job, you have to manage up. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, what we didn't do with the first mayor, we learned how to do very quickly with the second and the third mayor, well, my third mayor. Um, um, I think. Mayoral control overall has been a huge benefit for us. I don't think that we could have accomplished all that we've accomplished in these last eight years uh, if we had an elected school board. Um, that's not a knock against elected school boards. It's really um, a particular situation around what we needed to do in DCPS. We needed to make radical transformation happen. We needed to make it happen very quickly. And we couldn't do it by committee. Um, we couldn't do it by convincing a group of people um, about what we needed to do. In some cases, we needed to just go. And it's incredibly empowering as a leader to not have to try to convince people um, that, you know, what, about what we want to do for kids, but to go and say, can I do this, yes or no, and move it. Um, and to have then the funds that go along with that or the laws change that allow you to do that or the political cover when you know things are not looking exactly the way a politician might want it to look. And we've had that. We've had that under mayoral control. And I talk to my colleagues um, who are not under mayoral control, and many of them haven't been able to um, move as quickly as we have or do some of the things. Now, I think the, the trade-off is just because you have mayoral control doesn't mean it you can't take, that you don't take the time to engage the community. Um, it doesn't mean that just because you don't have an elected school board, it doesn't mean that you don't get to talk to anybody, you can just roll. Um, it means that you got different people that you have to talk to in a different way, get their input, get their feedback, and then move. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say you still have to talk to um, each and every one of these constituent groups. Um, whether or not it's mayoral control or a school board, frankly, I feel like we have more responsibility um, to talk to engaged stakeholders across the board um, so that there's an understanding that um, we are moving with the interests of the community um, as we make decisions. Mm -hmm. And so. Yeah, it forces us to behave differently. We can't rely on a school board member to um, be our proxy. Right in the community. We have to go build our own credibility in the community. We have to go out and talk to the community members and make sure that they understand what we're trying to do and why, as opposed to relying on somebody else to do that. And I think that has made us different, um, mm -hmm. having that responsibility. So last question, I, I reserve the right to ask the last question. I, it's, it's, it's built into a couple of the questions here. What would you tell um, other chancellors and other superintendents about 
the importance of family and community engagement. What, 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 what would you say to them about why this might be something that they consider? Um, I'd say doing the work of leading a school district is incredibly hard work. And if you are successful, um, <clears throat> that's a good thing for families and communities. But if they don't, if they aren't engaged in that success, that success can be rolled back really quickly. You could be rolled back really quickly. <laughs> um, and so if you want sustainable change, Tom Friedman is a good friend. The world is flat, the olive branch and Alexis or something, whatever. And um, Tom, yeah, because I read a lot in my spare time. Um, <laughs> so Tom said to me, you know, Kaya, the thing that I worry about with the ed reform movement is, you know, you're not taking the time, you, the royal you, are not taking the time to um, engage the community with the work that you're doing. And it's like Afghanistan, right? Russia was there 30 years ago and saved Afghanistan, but didn't do it with the community. And so 30 years later, the Americans are in saving Afghanistan. And again, not doing it with the Afghanis, right? To the Afghanis. And so, um, you know, he said, look, social movements, you know, transformative change, nothing will take root if the people who um, it affects aren't engaged in it. And that's my expert opinion as a foreign correspondent. And that's my expert opinion as a, a leader of a school district, that if you don't make the investment uh, as a, a district leader to engage the community, whatever you do is ephemeral. Um, whatever you do, it won't stick. Whatever you do, even if it's a great idea, uh, won't take root because people don't own it. Um, and I think um, I would say to any you know new superintendent, it takes time, it takes money, it takes commitment, it's hard. It would be much easier to just roll and do whatever you think is right, but um, that's not the key to success, and it's definitely not the key to sustainable success. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Josephine, do you want to add anything to that as a final I comment? will just say that the work that um, I and my team do could not be uh, done without the leadership uh, that comes from a chancellor who sees uh, the critical importance of family engagement. The fact that I sit on her management team and I'm not in a corner somewhere or I'm not buried within the organization is, is significant. It gives us the latitude and the platform by which to, to sh demonstrate to people that the chancellor, the leadership, DC Public School sees you and this work as important. Uh, and I don't take that for granted because we see um, school districts across the country who don't have um, the positioning of their family engagement work um, where it is relegated to a small team and it's called in in an emergency and it's not imbued across on the entire district. So um, what her leadership represents is a commitment um, to families and as both a, as somebody who works with her but at, most importantly as a parent who still entrusts her children, my children and my grandchildren in the system, that is incredibly important to me that I know that every single day um, as both a parent herself but as somebody sitting at the table making decisions uh, with her and informing those decisions that parents voices are represented uh, at the table each and every day in everything that we do. Well I think that's a beautiful note to end on and I want to thank both of you Chancellor Henderson, Josephine, thank you so much for being here. Thank you.